Schmini tells the tragic story of how the great inauguration of the tabernacle, a day about which the sages said that God rejoiced as much as he had at the creation of the universe, was overshadowed by the death of Aaron's two sons, Nadav and Avihu. Aaron's sons, Nadav and Avihu, took their censers, put fire in them and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which God hadn't instructed them to offer. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Many explanations were later given by the sages and the commentators as to what Nadav and Avuhu's sin actually was, but the simplest answer given by the Torah itself here and elsewhere is that they acted on their own initiative. They did what they hadn't been commanded. They acted spontaneously, perhaps out of sheer enthusiasm in the mood of the moment, offering unauthorized fire. Evidently, it's dangerous to act spontaneously in matters of the spirit. But is it? Moses acted spontaneously in far more fraught circumstances when he shattered the tablets of stone on seeing the Israelites cavorting around the golden calf. The tablets, hewn and engraved by God himself, were perhaps the holiest objects there have ever been. And yet Moses wasn't punished for his act. The sages said that though he acted on his own accord, without first consulting God, God assented to his act. Rashi refers to this moment in his very last comment to the Torah, whose last verse speaks about all the strong hand and the great awe which Moses performed, Leine kol Yisrael, in the eyes of all Israel. And Rashi says this refers to when Moses took the liberty of shattering the tablets before their eyes, as it said, I shattered them before your eyes. The Holy One, blessed be he, consented to his opinion, as it is said, Asher Shibarta, which you shattered, Yeyasher Shibarta, Yeshikoach, all power to you for shattering them. So why then was spontaneity wrong for Nodav and Avihu, yet right for Moshe Rabbeinu? The answer is this. Nadav and Avihu were Kohanim. They were priests. Moshe was a prophet, a Navi. And these are two completely different forms of religious leadership. They involve different tasks, different sensibilities, different approaches to time itself. The Kohen serves God in a way that never changes over time. Except, of course, when the temple was destroyed and its service presided over by the Kohenim came to an end. The prophet serves God in a way that is constantly changing over time. When people are at ease, the prophet warns of impending catastrophe. When they're suffering catastrophe and are in the depths of despair, the prophet brings consolation and hope. What he says is precisely geared to that moment. The words said by the Kohen are always the same. The priestly blessing uses the same words today as it did in the days of Moses and Aaron. But the words used by a prophet are never the same. The Gomorrah Sanhedrin says no two prophets use the same style. So for a prophet, spontaneity is of the essence, but for the Kohen, engaged in divine service, it is completely out of place. Why the difference? After all, the priest and the prophet were serving the same God. The Torah uses a kind of device here, actually, which we've only recently reinvented in a somewhat different form. Take stereophonic sound, sound that comes from two different speakers. That was developed in the 1930s to give the impression of audible perspective. In the 1950s, 3D film, which is kind of coming back today, was developed to do for sight what stereo had done for, for sound. From the work of Pierre Broca in the 1860s to today through MRI and PET scans, neuroscientists have striven to understand how our bicameral brain allows us to respond more intelligently to our environment that would otherwise have been possible. That's the perspective of the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Twin perspectives are needed fully to experience reality. The twin perspectives of the priest and the prophet correspond, for instance, to the twin perspectives represented on creation by the first story, Genesis 1, 
spoken in the priestly voice with an emphasis on order, structure, division, boundaries. And the second account, Barathees 2 to 3, spoken in the prophetic voice with an emphasis on the nuance and dynamics of interpersonal relationships. Now let's consider one area in which there was ongoing argument between structure and spontaneity, namely tefillah, prayer, specifically the Amida. We know that after the destruction of the temple, Rabban Gamliel and his court at Yavna established a standard text for the weekday Amida comprising 18 or later 19 blessings in a precise order. Not everyone agreed that you always had to say the same words the same way. Rabbi Yoshua held that individuals could say an abridged form of the Amida. According to some interpretations, especially by the Rishalmi, Rabbi Eliezer was opposed to a fixed text altogether and said that we should each day say something new. It seems that this disagreement is precisely parallel to another one about the source of the daily prayers. Here's the Gemara. It has been stated, Rabbi Yosef Rabbi Hanina said the prayers were instituted by the patriarchs. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said the prayers were intended to replace the daily sacrifices. Think about it. According to Rabbi Yossi Rabbi Hanina, Shachris was established by Avram, Mincha, by Isaac, Marif, by Jacob. But according to Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, Shachris corresponds to the Tamid Shel Bokeh, the daily morning service, Mincha to the Tamid Shel Ben Ha'abayim, the afternoon sacrifice. Now, on the face of it, the disagreement has no practical consequences, but in fact, it does. If the prayers were instituted by the patriarchs, then their origin is prophetic. But if they were established to replace the sacrifices, then their origin is priestly. Priests are forbidden to act spontaneously, but prophets do so as a matter of course. So somebody who saw prayer as priestly would, like Rabban Gamliel, emphasize the importance of a precise text that never changes. But somebody like Rabbi Eliezer, who saw it as prophetic, would value spontaneity and each day try and say something new. So it all depends on the priestly or prophetic source of prayer. Tradition eventually resolved the argument in a beautifully creative way. You see, we say each Amida twice, once privately and silently in the tradition of the prophets, and then a second time publicly and collectively, by a shliat zibur, the reader's repetition in the tradition of a priest offering a sacrifice in the temple. And of course now we understand why there's no repetition of the Amida in Marif, because at evening service there was no sacrifice. So during the silent Amida, we are permitted to add extra words of our own. We can be spontaneous. During the repetition, we can't. That's because the prophets acted spontaneously, but the priests didn't. The tragedy of Nadav and Avihu is that they made the mistake of acting like prophets when they were actually priests. But we have inherited both traditions, and wisely so, because without structure, Judaism would have no continuity. But without spontaneity, it would have no fresh life. The challenge is to maintain the balance without ever confusing the place of each. Shabbat Shalom.